also own the early struggle that my father went through when he tried to get the people in the hospital to own all that I am. And what I'm trying to say to America is I'm a black man writing about white poverty because I believe the mythology around poverty, the racist image that are often put in front of any time we try to deal with poverty, black mothers on welfare, dominate the, the mythological imagination of America. And it, and, it, and it not only demeans black people and suggests that poverty is a black issue, what it does is it leaves out millions and millions of white people. And until we face the reality of white poverty in America and all poverty in America, this book is written to say, we must truly look at all of the poor in our nation, not make it a marginal issue, but a central issue. At our, because in the richest na nation in the history of the world, the poverty that we have now and that's unbelievable, that's a, that you can change, that's abolishable, is in fact one of our greatest uh, immoral realities. You write that the uh, numbers that we use, the names that we use on poverty are not only a lie, you call them a damn lie. Explain that to me. Well, it's really bothersome that I made in the public administration and public policy. And when you talk to the average person, in fact, that they are, uh, the uh, government person, they'll say, oh, poverty is only 30 some million people. Our nation actually says that a person makes seven twenty-five an hour, they're not poor. We know that that's not true. The best economists know that's not true. When you look at those who would be in poverty if there wasn't some form of government assistance, if you look at those who are in poverty and no wages because they make less than fifteen, sixteen dollars an hour, they make less than a living wage. When you look at the fact that we've not raised the minimum wage for fourteen years to twenty oh nine. When you look at the fact that waiters and waitresses, for instance, make two dollars and thirteen cents an hour. Uh, by law. Well, what you recognize is the poverty numbers are much higher. In fact, our numbers show that uh, there are around 135 million poor and low wage people in this country. And every time we suggest uh, anyway, there's 30 some million, it's primarily a black or brown issue. It is a lie. It's a damn lie in the sense that the ancient prophets damn situations and said they were just wrong because it's a lie. And, and, it's, and poverty is not an anomaly. Uh, it's, it's, it's a feature, it's a central feature of our economic system. Over 41% of our adults are poor and or low wealth, and over 50% of our children, and we must deal with it solely by recognizing this. Wait, wait, you say it's a central feature of our economic system. Do you think it's just baked into what American capitalism is? Whether or not it's baked in or not, it is a reality. It's a reality that's consistent and persistent. The reality is year after year after year, we have these numbers for poverty. And what's happening is we're not dealing with the one group of politicians want to say poverty is the moral failing of poor folk. The other, or, or, or it's just a minority issue, primarily black and brown, when in fact, in raw numbers, there are 66 million poor and low wage white people, something in the neighborhood of 26 million poor and low wage black people now. That 26 million black is 58 to 6 percent of black people, and that 60 million, 66 million is 30 percent of white people. But the problem is, we don't even talk about that. And so, what we have is a situation where now, poor people are dying at a rate from poverty, according to a recent study, uh, of 800 people uh, a, a, a day, and over uh, um, uh, 290 some thousand people a year are dying from unnecessary, abolishable poverty. The fact that we can have time and time again, presidential elections, Senate elections, and debates go on and on, and we never talk about the 41% of our uh, uh, Americans that are in poverty, uh, they're not a state where poor people are not at least 30% of the population, and some states over 40%, and we don't even talk about it, we don't even debate it. That's what we mean. Uh, that is central, but it's being treated like it's a minor issue when in fact it is a major issue. But nowadays, blacks and whites are pitted against each other instead of unifying in a war on poverty. Why has that happened? Well, what we say in the book is that this history of the day is not recent or new. It is a continuum of the divide. Uh, it was the welfare rights women black and white women who went to Dr. King and said we needed a poor people's campaign. And one of the things Dr. King talked about were that these two Americans that exist, one flowing with milk and honey and all of the, the, the things needed for a life of prosperity, and then the other one full of church and pain. 
What we know is down through history, whether it was the effort to break apart the coalition of black, uh, of former slaves and freedmen and poor and lonely white people that came together after the Civil War to reconstruct America, or whether we saw that, see the efforts of the Southern strategy in the late 60s that decided that they were going to engage in intentional polarization and that they were going to split a black and white people, particularly in the South, so that those persons would not come together and form a powerful voting bloc that could shift the economic architecture of the country. We have seen down through history this is the attempt to, to, to separate the bad people that should be together. In our book, we talk about myths. One myth is that pale skin is a shared interest. In other words, that, that, that skin color uh, outweighs the ability for people to unify around policy and around uh, saving their lives. And we believe that's a mythology. Uh, only black folk want change in America. We point out clearly that that is not true. Uh, the fact of the matter is over 60% of Americans want to see us raise the minimum wage to a living wage. In your book, you have a lot of examples politically where you're around the country and you can see how low-income whites and low-income blacks could work together on policy, could and have voted together mm -hmm. at times. Describe that and why is that not more common? Well, what we're seeing, and, and it's not often talked about, the real swing vote in this country is poor and low-wage vote. It's the largest block of voting where you could have an expansion of, of, of the voting population. First of all, black and white and brown and whatnot, poor and low-wage people do vote. You know, you often hear they don't, but they do 57 million in the last election. And when you look at the exit poll, they voted in the majority for a uh, uh, progressive idea. They voted in the majority for candidates that, 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 uh, that represent that somewhere in the neighborhood of plus 54%, 55%. What we, what we know is that so often the attempt is to suggest, uh, the division comes of folk want to suggest, this is just something that's happening to black people, and therefore black people, or black women, or poor folk are getting something and you're losing something, and that's used as a, as a win. When in fact people figure out that's not the case, they come together. Take, for example, in Kentucky. We went to Eastern Kentucky, uh, where uh, the White, Harlan County, Kentucky, where Harlan County, USA, where Mindy Dane Johnson actually started the war on poverty. And we met, uh, I met with two or three hundred poor and low wage, mostly white people who were minors, who no longer have human rights because when the powers that be allowed multinational companies to take over the Nine, they didn't ensure that they, they would have their human right. And on that day, we put up uh, uh, a chart of where state legislators stood on issues like anti-gay, uh, anti-abortion, and prayer in the school. Then we put up a chart showing where legislators stood on living wages and union rights and labor rights and health care. And when we step back from that chart, one of the guys who I talked about in the book, making the point, said, we're being fooled. We're being bamboozled. He said, these folks are coming to us, and they're telling us there's a family value because they're anti-gay and anti-abortion. But on the other hand, they're voting against our legal way. They're voting against our union rights, which means they're voting against Paul and County. In 2018, when black and white folk found that out and Brown and King together, they unseated an incumbent uh, government. And several of those counties that we were in, they actually went some so-called red to blue. I don't believe, lastly, that we even know what a red state was or blue state because we've never seen a full pushing of the electorate that's possible. And we've certainly never seen poor and low wage folk vote at the same level that um, a wealthy of voters, a middle class and wealthy of voters too. Yeah, but you look at both Democrats and Republicans, I mean, even Democrats that were supposed to be part of this movement, they're not doing a lot of that talking. Uh, why is that? Which is why we question it. Right? Why we say that Republicans are, are wrong when they suggest that poverty is a moral failing of individuals and not an issue of policy. Uh, because it doesn't matter how moral you live, if you only make $7.25 an hour, you're still coming out poor. Uh, and that's a policy issue. Democrats too often talk about middle class, 
and they talk about listing from the middle or they talk about those who are trying to get into the middle class. What we are saying to both sides is stop talking and know that and talk to poor and low wage people. Speak. Well, wait a second. Yes, Bill, when you're talking about talking to the middle class that way, getting into the middle class, it, it sounds like Joe Biden. Are you blaming him too? It, our, this is an American. It's not only one particular president or administration. What this book points out is far too long that we may pile into some marginal issue. And when we do talk about it, we tend to, uh, let me make up a word, we tend to blackenize it. Uh, and when we do talk about it, it might be one day on the news that it goes away, or we only talk about homelessness. What we're arguing, whether it's Biden or Trump or Obama or Clinton or Bush or whoever comes next, that we as a matter of must face this issue. We must face poverty. We must face the wounds of poverty to black people and white people. When uh, eight Democrats and all the Republicans voted against raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour, we didn't care if they were Democrat or Republican. That was wrong. And not only is it wrong based on our constitutional claim of justice law, it's wrong based on our deepest religious traditions. And all of these politicians that took their hands on Bible and swear to uphold the Constitution were inside of that Bible. That Bible says, that whether it's uh, 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 from the Jewish tradition or the scriptures that Jewish, Muslim, and Christians all honor, or whether it's from the New Testament, that the poor must be at the center of how we handle and build our society. In fact, there's a great scripture I use often, Isaiah chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. Woe unto those who legislate evil and rob the poor of their rights and make women and children pray, T-R-E-Y. Both the Bible and our Constitution says that poor people, those on the margin, have a right to justice. They have a right to a just society. They have a right to, to, to the kind of policy that will allow them to come out of the unnecessary, abolishable, damnable, and death-killing reality of poverty.